name is Joshua Negrera, and I'm the Acting Director at the Center for Real Estate Finance Research at NYU Stern School of Business. I'm joined by my colleague, Devin Clemens. We're thrilled to welcome Stephen Ross, who is the Chairman and Majority Owner of The Related Companies. The Related Companies has brought us innovative real estate development projects, including the Time Warner Center and Hudson Yards, and is also one of the largest owners of affordable housing. Steve, if you wouldn't mind, would you please introduce yourself for our viewers? You just introduced me. But <laughs> if anything else you'd like to add. What more can I say? You know, um, I mean, besides that, I'm involved with Equinox and uh, uh, Miami Dolphins and a number of other, you know, investments. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we'll jump into the questions. Uh, what trends were you seeing in real estate prior to the pandemic? And do you see those trends continuing or shifting? Well, I think with the pandemic, you have to look at things totally different than before. I mean, prior, um, you know, when you talk about real estate, you know, you have to look across the country. And certainly every market's different than the other. Um, if you're talking about New York City, I mean, we were facing a, uh, I would say, a, a large overbuilding of, of condominiums in the city. Um, retail, you know, was suffering as, as, as much as any industry. Um, but overall, you know, the office market was very strong. The economy was strong. Uh, job growth was good. So, uh, you know, it was very positive. And probably, that was probably true mostly across the rest of, this, of the country. I mean, we're involved in other, you know, key markets. And, uh, you know, certainly uh, California, Silicon Valley is probably the strongest market in the country. Uh, but all cities were really uh, doing pretty well you know, from a commercial standpoint, you know, you can just look at the stock market, you can look at the economy and jobs, you know, everything was very positive. Today, it's a different story. So kind of, kind of to that idea of being a different story, do you feel like, um, you know, this kind of recession or economic cycle that we're in now, do you see it being similar to other real estate cycles or do you see this being different? And if what's so in what ways? I mean, this is a lot different. I mean, business didn't fail because of the markets. You know, it failed because of the pandemic. And I don't think anybody, you know, you know that, you're, that you talk to or know has ever lived through a pandemic before and, and the impact that it has. And, and you know, um, people have been hurt, you know, who are running great businesses and, you know, uh, being the cause to go out of business. I mean, so th this is totally, totally different than anything we've ever experienced before. I mean, and the problem you have today is that, you know, some wise person told me a long time ago when one of our recessions, he says, you know, when things are bad, people never see how they're gonna get good. And when they're good, you never see how they're gonna get bad. Uh, and I think today people are living with the idea that, hey, things are bad and they can't see how they can get good. And they think that life today is what we're having to live it will continue in the past and making decisions based on today's facts and not looking to see that, you know, or believing the change will occur and we'll get back to the good days. All right, thank you for that. Um, going off what we're seeing currently, we've noticed an obvious disruption in hospitality and retail. Uh, do you feel the effects of COVID-19 will disrupt any specific asset classes in real estate in the longer term coming out of this? Oh yeah, I mean, no question about it. I mean. You look at retail and you look at um, uh, lodging. I mean, those are the two areas today. I would say every almost retail mall um, and hotel is probably, you know, uh, facing bankruptcy um, because they've been closed, you know, or they've been losing money and they have debt service to pay. And, uh, and I think probably none of them can really afford to pay the debt service and the defaults are going to be incredible. So how are we going to really deal with this on a massive scale, you know, and certainly, you know, if, if people put projects in bankruptcy or even through the courts, when the courts are inundated with this type of uh, volume, they end up making bad law. And I think, you know, this is really the, the scariest part of coming out of all this is the impact on small business and such a large percentage of the employment you know, is involved in large business. And how can you go back to normal with these things, with this overhang and knowing that a lot of these businesses would not be able to reopen. 
And that's what we really are going to have to address. People today in you know, Congress, they're all concerned today about you know, dealing with the pandemic, making sure people are getting food and, and you know, being able to afford to stay alive. But after that, I mean, people want to go back to life as normal. And if we don't take care of small business, it's going to be very difficult to see life back to normal. So kind of kind of along those those same lines, um, Steve, you know, talking about small business and the the economic road to recovery. Uh, how, how do you see the the future of cities? I know there's kind of a narrative and a question about maybe the the fleeing of cities and you know some um, thoughts around uh, density right now. You obviously have a big you know investment and your team does with Hudson Yards and a big investment in New York, New York City. What's your outlook for New York City as we move forward through this? Yeah. I mean, this is a part where I think people are really, you know, kind of overreacting. I mean, the, the trend today is that people want to be in cities. And, uh, and there's so much talk about now how, how business is going to change, how offices are going to change, where people are going to work. I mean, but you got to look at it. I look at it this way. Young people want to be in cities. That's a trend that's not going to stop, okay? Because this pandemic will come to an end hopefully sooner than later with a vaccine. And, you know, people are going to go back to their normal ways. Um, and with the idea that people want to be in cities, corporations are going to have to stay in cities because the way a corporation can survive and how they do well is being able to attract and recruit people. And if the young people want to be in cities, which they do, and there's no question they're not, they're not interested in going back to the suburbs or that, corporations have no choice but to stay in cities because their lifeline is the ability to recruit good people. And people are tending to forget that. All of a sudden, people are panicking. I want to go somewhere else. I want to be in the suburbs. I want to de-densify. That sounds great, but it's not realistic. It's an overreaction to what's happening. And the problem that I see and the biggest issue is that people are talking about how it's changing and will change. And it, becomes a, it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that will destroy a lot of corporations. People know that people have to work together and that you cannot work at home and work as a team. We're not a bunch of individuals. Companies, you know, by definition, are large, you know, are, are people working together. And people can't work together over uh, a computer, you know, with Zoom calls. I mean, it's just not the way for the long term. Yeah, we'll get through this, but life is not going to change as all these people are really projecting like that. This will come to an end. We will get back to normal, but the road back will be tough from what a lot of people are saying and, and reacting to on, on a short-term basis. All right. Thank you for that. Um, we've heard you talk about the value of creativity when speaking to other aspiring real estate professionals. And how do you recommend fostering and building that creativity? And what can our, our students do as they enter the workforce to foster that creativity? Well, I mean, you've got to look, I mean, creativity is looking where trends are, where people want to be. I mean, that's the creative part. I mean, you, you know, you look at the world today and you see how it is and you, and you say, well, where's the shifting and, and how do I make it better? And that's where the creativity aspect, you know, uh, comes in. And I, I think today, I mean, I've always thought you know, that, you know, trying to understand where people are and, and understand where trends are going and understanding young people, because that's what people, older people follow younger people. They like their ideas. Everybody who's old wants to be young, you know, and, and that's how places grow. I mean, but nobody writes about that, <laughs> you know, and then you have all these, uh, uh, consultants who now want to be heard for the first time that they can sell, sell or something that life is changing and they look at and that and that's what's occurring today and, and that's what's concerning to me people are starting to really believe that I think for young people understand what you want and think and how you really relate to the rest of uh, you know of your uh, of your group, age group you know and where they're going and where business is and that's where life is going So, so kind of to that, to that idea, do you see any trends resulting from this as we kind of move forward this, or do you feel like it might be too early to identify any significant trends? Well, 
I mean, there's going to be a trend there. Now, if you look back at what happened, you know, after 9-11 or after the Sandy, you know, the storm Sandy, and people always said, hey, you know, people won't live in high rises before. I mean, there's an overreaction. Or, but what came out of 9-11? People wanted to feel secure across the country. So what do we have? The protections of, of, of security, airports, you know, all these portals that you go through, you're being scanned and all that. So there will be something that, come, that comes out of this. I mean, this is really probably, you know, the, the worst that anybody has ever gone through. And, then, and, you know, there's nobody around to really talk about anything, you know, because it's something that impacts everybody everywhere, right? So I think what's going to come out of this and what's going to be on people's minds is that they have to know that one, it's not going to happen again, but also protecting uh, themselves and feeling safe from a health standpoint. So there's going to be, you know, portals that, that people are checking to see if they're allowed to, you know, uh, come into buildings. They're going to be, uh, uh, I mean, we see a lot of, uh, and are looking at um, ultraviolet lights uh, that's called FAR uh, UV that doesn't harm the uh, eyes or, or, or skin, where people they can check and keep rooms you know, clean of all types of the pathogens. You know, people want to know that they're going to be kept clean and that one, it's not going to happen again. So the resiliency is a very, very big uh, uh, result of what has to come out of this to make people really feel good. Right. Do you think the floor plan of the office will change? It'll go from that bullpen inside, the co-working no. space, those kind of things, or no? No, I don't think so, because I think, you know, one, it comes down to economics. Once we go back and there's a, there's a vaccine, people are going to forget. I mean, the great thing about the human mind, it can forget, you know, and it goes on. And in corporations, you know, why did we get with the densifying? You know, one, the cost of doing business and the fact how people really communicate with each other. And that's what's important. And that's what made business, you know, that's what makes business successful and, you know, and how it changes. So I think immediately, sure, people are going to say, hey, I got to change the whole thing. But once you have a vaccine and life is back to normal, we're going to go back to things like that. But that doesn't mean you're not going to be checked when you come to the office. You know, you might go through a portal, which is important. It's taking your temperature and, you know, and, and doing things like that or cleansing your body of all types of viruses. These are the type of things, or there's ultraviolet lights that are on, killing all the pathogens in the air as well, you know, and, and on the surface. And those are things that people are just gonna feel comfortable that that's what's going on. Those are the type of things that I think will really uh, come, will come out of where we are today once we do have a vaccine. So Steve, you've obviously had a really great career that has kind of, you know, led you to this point in, in your perspective and gives you a unique perspective on this type of situation that we're currently going through. What would you say would be the, the best advice that you've received uh, throughout your career? Well, I mean, you know, you got to be able to take the ups and the downs, you know, this is about as bad as it gets, you know, and therefore, you know, you can look up and, uh, you know, I always look at things. How do you make a positive when things are really down? You know, and really probably, you know, people have a lot of time on their hands to really understand themselves and see what, you know, life's past they want to take and where their strengths and weaknesses are. And, you know, in, in times of crisis though, I think one of the most important things that can occur is that you got to take advantage of that crisis because people are more prepared for change than ever before. And we have to look in this country how do we create the change we need as we go into a third industrial revolution? You know, the world is changing. We were at that point, that we were at that reflection point where we have to do something. We have to do something about the climate, which is probably the most important thing that we can deal with, how it'll affect us and, 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 and all of our, all the future generations, you know? And I, I think today we, we, we have to be looking and seeing, you know, where can we make it better? You know, and one of the things like, because we were on, we, we were on a path, you know, that really couldn't sustain itself in the long term. Uh, I mean, the costs were getting out of hand, you know, and, and the demands of people 
from government were getting out of hand or what they expected. We got to go back and really re-examine where we are, what we can do, understanding the resources we have, you know, and, and, the, and the time we're there. I mean, the biggest issue we have facing ourselves before this, and, 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 and part of it could be a result of that, excuse me, uh, the, um, you know, it was, was the climate issue, you know, and we have to deal with that issue. And I think every you know young person understands that issue that you know we have to get off of fossil fuels. You know it's not going to happen overnight, but we got to start doing things that really can ensure our future. Thank you for that. And and you know as as people kind of have more time on their hands now and they're thinking about how to prepare for change, do you have any specific maybe books that you might recommend to well, our I students? With, I mean, there, there's. Uh, a friend of mine that I'm working very closely with named Jeremy Rifkin. Um, uh, Jeremy uh, really uh, led the change uh, 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 into the third industrial revolution in Germany, working with uh, uh, Merkel, as well as in France and working with the European uh, uh, common market there, uh, and also in, in uh, China. And I'm working very closely with him. and because we need to make this transition into this third industrial revolution. And it, it, because when you have so much change occurring, you know, I think that this really sets the path for us to look forward. And, you know, we need a, sh sometimes you need a shock to get there. I mean, we've really had a shock. There's no question about it. But it, I also think take advantage of that and really open your minds and accept the fact we couldn't go the way we were going and look forward to what we need to do in order to you know, ensure you know, the future generations of the benefits of what we've had, or what I've had. You guys are young and you still have to look forward to that. You know? Thank you for that. Um, speaking of the young, and we just had our graduation here at Stern uh, a week ago. Do you have any advice for the real estate students who recently graduated who were very excited to go into the job market and, and are looking currently, what do you think those students can do? Well, I mean, I think, you know, today, I mean, you, you got to think bold because, you know, it's not like, it's, it's, it's not going to be easy to just, to, you know, uh, enter the job market and like it's been in the past and people recruiting, corporations are going through a lot of problems, you know, and all that. So I think young people today, I mean, if I were getting out of school, I would really assess myself, know where my strengths are, see where I think the, this, uh, where there's opportunities and be bold. And, you know, if you're entrepreneurial, step forward. So force you to be a little bit more bold. You have nothing to lose, you know? I mean, uh, because people aren't waiting for you. You gotta make things happen and, and understanding that and, and what you're entering into. So I think those who are the most entrepreneurial and think that way and act that way will be the ones who really do the best. And, you know, and if they're right, uh, I mean, this could be just a really, you know, the, the start of something great, you know. And I, today, I think you have to think bold because you've got nothing to lose. Thank you for that. And kind of going off of that, where do you see for the entrepreneurial recent grad, where do you think the investment opportunities are? coming out of this in real estate specifically? Well, I mean, there's going to be a tremendous amount of money put into infrastructure going forward. And, you know, and I think the greatest need, though it's going to be difficult to do, is going to be affordable housing, you know, and recognizing that our cities will be changing from the standpoint that, you know, uh, we are going, we're entering the era of the driverless car and the impact of what that'll have in shared driving you know, and how that's going to impact, the, the, you know, the cities and, and, and real estate development. And that will be occurring. I mean, you know, uh, a lot of that technology is already here and people are, you know, are, are, uh, are trying to understand it. The cities are working with that. And I think that change is great because change offers opportunity and change is about, it. you know, it's here. So that will open up a lot of opportunity if you don't, if you think, and you got to think outside the box. 
Thank you for that. So now we have um, some questions uh, or a question from one of our recent real estate students. Hi, Mr. Ross. Thank you for taking the time today. My name is Elliot Pines and I just graduated from the full-time MBA program. My question for you is, other than incentives like rent abatement, is there anything else that owner operators have done to help keep retail tenants in business? Thank you. Well, I mean, you know, to keep the retail tenants in business, uh, you know, the landlord has to pay, you know, his debt service and real estate taxes. Uh, I believe though that, you know, we as landlords have to work with those tenants who can't afford it because one, they're going to be very, very hard to replace. Number two, the cost of replacing them by the brokerage and the tenant work is also going to be costly. So I think you really have to, you know, your best opportunity as an owner oftentimes will be to work it out with that tenant who's proved to be a good tenant in the past and give them a little, you know, you know, everybody's suffering. And if you think you're going to be the tough guy and you're going to drive out your tenants who have been successful, you're going to lose in the long run. I wanted to go back to something you said a little bit earlier. You were talking about some of the portals going into offices and things like that to keep people healthy and keep them kind of relaxed in the new post-COVID world. Do you see any innovations like that on the residential side? Anything going to make the common spaces more healthy or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I, they're going to have to do the same type things, you know, for into residential buildings and things like, you know, and things like that. I mean, technology, this is where technology comes in and allowing us to do things differently to protect the tenants, you know, and, and what, what you have to really do. And tenants want to know that they are being protected and you are doing all you can and using the latest in technology to do that. Great. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. Uh, we hope you stay healthy and... Uh... You know, well, you know, these, you know, hopefully become exciting times. We get through this endemic. Everybody stay safe. But then, you know, fasten your seatbelt because it's going to be a different kind of ride. And, uh, and you know, have a lot of optimism and, and, and be bold. And uh, I think I wish you all the best of luck. And... Uh, you know, what are you looking forward to getting back to? Is it eating at a restaurant? Is it playing tennis? What, a, what are you oh, looking forward I, to? I love what I do. I'd like to get back in the office and just, you know, the conversations in the office, the talk around the, you know, as you say, the water cooler, if you will, inter interacting with people again. I mean, that's what, that's what life's all about, right? Absolutely. Thank you again. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.